And a lot of people are like, oh, I sacrifice and I give to God the tithe. That, it isn't yours to begin with. What are you doing sacrificing it? It's already God's. It said bring it, not give it. Because when you think about giving it, how many of you know then that means you had ownership of it? And it wasn't yours because I want to tell you, God has 100% of your finances, really. And I mean, it's a pretty good deal that he only asked for 10%. I mean, we all have our little imperfections, but the power and the principles of God are true. Amen. And they're everlasting, and they can bring us to a place that we've never been before. And there's a thing called first fruits, and, and it isn't really just a principle for the new year, but it's a principle, I believe, for the entire year. And what it is, is it's about a story when God, and throughout the Bible, but it, the, what I want to read from in Exodus is when God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, and that's like our salvation, really. And he's getting ready to bring them into the promised land. And he's going to give them a land that flows with milk and honey that they did not earn. And they did not pay for. And they're going to eat from trees they did not plant. And they're going to harvest from crops they did not plant themselves. But they are going to be blessed because they're the people of God. And... There's something these people needed to understand just like I believe we need to understand today. How many of you are God above all that we would prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers? But how many of you know Galatian also said, deceive yourself not, God is not mocked, that which a man sows he will also reap. So how many of you know you have to sow things to actually reap a crop? And I say that because in Exodus 13, God is trying to explain to the Israelites, and this is what he said. And it shall come to pass, the Lord will bring you into a land, the land of Canaan, as he swore to you and your fathers and gave it to you, that you should set apart to the Lord all that opens the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from the animal which you have, the male, the male, shall be the Lord's. How many of you know God still requires from us our love, our care, and it isn't because He's insecure, but it's His way that we really know that we love God. And it's really called the first fruits. And what He's trying to tell them there is, to us today, this would maybe make no sense, but what He's really saying is, everything that comes out first I desire that you bring that to me, and that's mine, and the rest is yours. But if you'll bring me that, when I bring you into the promised land, I will cause the curse to lift from your life. Amen. And I will bring you into a place that flows with milk and honey, and you will honor your God, and my people will be blessed because they understand this principle. Amen. And then he goes on to say, but every firstborn of the donkey you shall redeem. How many of you know this is talking about Jesus? He's saying this, that you shall redeem by the blood of a lamb. And if you do not redeem it, you need to break its neck. How many of you know that's pretty strong terminology? Amen, that's right. And all the first of all the men... Among you, your sons, you shall redeem. Now, how many of you know Jesus has redeemed us through his blood and what he did? And this is really a forerunning of what God is telling us. He is saying, our Egypt was when we didn't know God. And our Egypt was when we was a slave to the world. But how many of you know he's saying, I'm bringing you out of the world into my place, and when I do, I want you to dedicate the firstborn always to me. Now the firstborn, how many of you know they had flocks and animals, and, and they produced fruit, and 
They did all of those things. And there's always been a thing called first fruits before God, even in the New Testament. It says, deceive yourself, not that which a man sows, he will also reap. But it also says, give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. How many of you know that really what we've got to understand about first fruits, the very first thing, is that it's not ours anyway. It's God's. And what a number of people don't really understand is it goes on to say here, so it shall be when your sons ask you in the times to come, saith, what is this? That you can say, be strong, for the hand of the Lord brought me out of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. How many of you want to totally be set free here? If you understand the power of that, then what it's really saying is there is a principle called first fruits that if you bring it to God and you ask that anointing, you have the right to claim that freedom in Him. And how many of you know, as much as I love America, I've been in the military, I was in Vietnam for 18 months, I love my country, but my country doesn't make me free, my God makes me free. Yeah, that's right. And I'm proud to be an American and I'm glad I live here than anywhere else in the earth. But I want to tell you right now, my freedom comes from God, not because some man of this world speaks that over me, but it's because what God promises me in His Word. Amen. And so real freedom isn't always what we think it is, but that freedom is available to us, to us that understand this power. And so the reason we dedicate 2014 First Fruits to God is only a start of the year, but how many of you know this really deals, and everybody say, I love pastor. Love pastor. How many of you know this is talking about money? Because how many of you know we don't raise flocks? We don't raise goats? I don't know about you, but I don't have any donkeys. <laughs> but how many of you know I still need to understand the principle of first fruits? And the reason I need to do that is because we need to bring the first of every financial gain we have in our life to God. Not the second, not the third. He isn't first, he's either first or he's not anything really doing in our life. We're not allowing him to operate. And I know when you talk about money, people say, well, all they want down there is that church is money. Well, how many of you know that it isn't about money, it's about your heart? Yes. It's about understanding the power of your heart, whether you really say, you know, a lot of people, how many of you know that you can say, I love God, I want God, I walk with God, but not really be a servant to God? I said you can do that, amen? amen. And so the power and the anointing of that really is sowing and giving the power of the anointing and first fruits to the love that we have because of God. And how many of you know that money is not evil, but the love of money is? Yeah. And you know, I have people say, well, money, man, it's all about money. No, it isn't about money. It's about are you willing to give God what's His? Come on. Because the second thing I want you to really understand about this is you don't give God anything when it comes to first fruits. You bring it to Him because it's already His. Yeah. The Word says in Malachi, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Bring it. In other words, what it really means is how many of you know that it's already God's? Because if you're going to give it, that means you think you owned it. Yes. It'd be like me saying this to you. It'd be like me borrowing Pastor Mike's truck, and then a few hours later coming back and being all spiritual and having quivering lips and just saying, I'm really, oh, Pastor Mike, here's the keys. I give you the keys to this truck. Oh, thank you. It is your truck, but here, I give it to you. How many of you know it's already his? I'm not giving him anything. <laughs> I'm bringing him his keys back is all I'm doing. And a lot of people are like, oh, I sacrifice and I give to God the tithe. That, it isn't yours to begin with. What are you doing sacrificing it? Amen. It's already God's. Yeah. It said bring it. Not give it. Because when you think about giving it, how many of you know then that means you had ownership of it? That's right. And it wasn't yours because I want to tell you, God has 100% of your finances, really. And I mean, it's a pretty good deal that he only asked for 10%. That's better than the country you live in. Yes. <laughs> Come on, church. Right. Somebody should be shouting me down there. 
And what's amazing is about, you don't just have to pay the tenth of the increase, but you also have, if you, if you get an inheritance, do you know what the government wants of that? 48%. Wow. They want half of your inheritance. Just look at your neighbor and say, it's a good deal with God, hallelujah. <laughs> How many of you know it's always a good deal with God? What he asked for is 10%. And a lot of times why people can't understand. In fact, I can tell you openly before the Lord, I make less money right now than I did when I was 30 years old, but I live better than I've ever lived in my life. And because it wasn't about the money or how much it was, it was how, what I did with the money. Listen to me very carefully. Do you know that really where, where the real problem lies is we want to eat all the fruit? Now, what do I mean by that? Do you know I could set a table up out in the foyer, and I wish I could, but I wouldn't even if I could. I'm going to be transparent with you. And I could pay every bill off everybody had in this room. And do you know next year by this time, over 70% of you would be right back in debt again? And so everybody says, oh, it's the indebtedness that really keeps me from doing what I want to do. It isn't the indebtedness. That's like saying, I remember I was at a pastor's conference. If I would have waited for God to provide everything, we would have never had a three and a half, four million dollars worth of property now after all the years I've been here because how many of you know, we never started out with that. We, I mean, I look, I look back over the, the books when the first service we had in here, we had 18 people and I think we took in $36. And how many of you know that it really wasn't about the money, it was about being faithful with what God gave us to use. Amen. And I say this because we all think we're sacrificing something when how many of you know God's the God of 100% but he only asks for the first fruit. Amen. And so we bring it to him so that he blesses the 90. Amen. And when we don't do that, sadly enough, and, and listen, I'm not telling you this, uh, just look at your neighbor and say, relax, he's already received the offering. It's a principle, though, that if I don't teach you about, how many of you know someday I'm going to stand before the Lord Amen. and give an account of what I teach you? And if I don't teach you about this, how will you know? Because how many of you know the world is selfish? And it's taught us a lot of things that we didn't really need. Number three, God will never be second. And I just already kind of talked about this, but how many of you know it really shows whether he's first or second or third. And, and people say, well, I just can't afford it. I had one guy say, they can't not afford it. Right. That's right. Yes. And really, it's a pretty good deal when you really think about being first with God. He desires that first fruit. And, and listen to me. What's, what's so great about this plan is this, if how, much, how many of you know, if you make $100, God asks $10. Right. <laughs> if you make $1,000, God asks $100. If you make a million dollars, God asks $100,000. How many of you know a lot of people say, well, they can just afford it. I can't. Well, the, the zeros get more. And believe me, if you can't write the $10 check, you can't write the $100,000 check. I had a guy come to me one time and he got an inheritance and he had been struggling and and he didn't really understand this principle. And this is what he said. Another person said that he was going to give a certain amount of money because he came into this. And, and so he brought me a check and he said, here's this check, but I'm not giving 10% of it all because, you know, I really need it. But don't tell the other people that. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell them anything unless they ask, but I'm not going to lie for you. But see, they reasoned in their mind how they couldn't afford it. Don't you know if you made a million dollars, you could reason in your mind why you couldn't give the hundred thousand dollars. When you had been believing for that all along. I mean, I have people say, oh, just as soon as I win the lottery. <laughs> well, let me tell you right now, the last lottery that was 600 and, uh, around 600 million dollars, if you stood in the same place you would have had to have been struck by lightning seven times in the same place to win that lottery. Wouldn't you rather have a principle that you could do that would work every time? 
And God will not be second in your life. He has to have the power. And then really this might even sound very calloused, if you will, but how many of you know we need to understand also that God wants to get the curse off of us. Malachi says this, 3.9, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Now what does he mean by that? You know, I used to think openly that God was going to curse you if you didn't give. How many of you know God loves you, God cares about you, and he is not going to put a curse on you even if you don't tithe? Because when you read that, what he's really saying is this. You were cursed with a curse, and if you don't understand this principle, you're still cursed with the curse. It isn't that he's going to put a curse on you, you're already under a curse. It's a curse of the world. See, the world had a curse. This started clear back in the beginning when Adam and Eve fell. What did they do? They, God said, give me one thing, the tree of life, and don't you touch it. That's mine. And what did they do? They ate from the tree of life, that which was God's. And what happened? The entire world was cursed. Do you know a lot of the things that happen in our life, God isn't trying to curse us. He's trying to get the curse off of us. What he's really saying is, I don't want you to act like the world any longer because they're cursed. With a curse, I want you to act as a son and daughter of God and be blessed. And the way you can do that is to relieve yourself of the curse you had when you got saved. Good preaching, Pastor. Amen. Because it isn't God wanting to curse you. It's that you're cursed before you know God. And what you do is you carry that curse right into Christianity and listen to me very carefully. It's just like some places, they don't really understand. I've been around the world, and it's great to see people get set free. But how many of you know, even though people come to know God, sometimes they'll bring some of their old habits into the kingdom of God. You have to be really careful in India, because there's, I don't even remember how many different types of religion there. But what happens is people get saved, and almost like in, anybody ever been to New Orleans? Has anybody ever heard, you know, of Cajuns? You know, they're French people that moved over here and mixed with the Indians and the different people. And they'll bring some of that culture, even witchcraft. In. Some of them read tea leaves and, and they call themselves Christian churches. And they'll read tea leaves and play with Ouija boards. How many of you know God has no place for that? Well, we do the same thing. See, what they haven't done is release themselves from the curse of the world. Can I get an amen in this house? Because we have to be careful. We don't do the same thing. We would never say, oh, I'm going to go out and practice witchcraft. But if we don't get set free from the world, how many of you know if we're still acting like we're in the world and we say we know God and we don't understand what God has really got and has and is His we are cursing ourselves. He doesn't want to curse us. What he wants to do is lift the curse from us. He wants to get the curse off of us. But what happens is we curse ourselves because we don't understand the principles of God. What begins to happen is we rationalize in our mind just like the world does. How many of you know the world can never afford it? Well, I want to tell you, as long as you think you can never afford to give to God what is His, how many of you know, how many of you would say literally with me, well, I want my life changed, but I don't want to do anything to make it happen. <laughs> or how many of you, I mean, how many of you would go to a car dealership and say, I want that new truck, but I want you to give it to me. <laughs> They'll shake your hand, smile, and kick you out the door. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I want the blessing of God. I want this in my life. But they don't want to lift the curse. I want my family set free. I want all these things to happen. But they don't even give God what's already His. And when we don't do that, it isn't like God wants to curse us. He's trying to lift the curse from us. And so we've got to understand the real power and principle of that and the anointing that really takes place. And so if we're going to lift the curse and God desires that, how many of you know if you really want your family free, 
In fact, let me just say this. Do you know your kids are watching? And I don't know if you've realized it or not, but the day of do what I say, not what I do is over. I mean, you know, the generation, the, the millennial generation that's coming up right now, they want to come and hear, and we have a number of them, and I meet with some of them uh, once a month, and, and it's a great thing, but this is what I found about the millennial generation. The millennial generation says, oh, I love your sermons, and I want you to preach to me, but do you mind if I watch your life for a while? Because how many of you know that's what's going to minister to them? Not a good sermon, not a good word. But can I watch your life for a while? And that's why I want to hang out with them, because I want them to see our life. I want them to see that I'm not perfect, but I walk with God. And that my steps are ordered by the Lord. I don't live by luck. I live by the power and the Word of God. And the kids are watching. And let me tell you right now, one of the reasons why sometimes they're watching is because of this. It says here, we need to understand one of the first things we have to do in the greatness of God is to teach it to our kids by how we give. You know, we tell them they need to be productive citizens. They need to be this. They need to be that. But then in the kingdom of God, we barely get by. Oh, good preaching. Why do I say this? Because look at verse 14 in Exodus. It says, So it shall be when your sons ask you in times to come, say, what is, saying, what is this? Why are you giving? You know, I, I like to think of it like this. They're probably saying this. Well, Dad and Mom, why are you doing that? You know, I'm an accountant. I have a degree. Don't you know what we could do with that first one? Boy, look at what we could get out of that. But then it says, tell them that the Lord delivered me from bondage. Tell them I could never give him enough. And we wonder why. I'm going to tell you openly. We blame society, school, their friends, all of these things, but what about us? What are they seeing from us? Well, I'm not getting very many amen, amens this morning. Why? Because we don't want to do the principles God tells us to do, but we want them to line up to the principles we set over them. But yet, if God, our spiritual father, tells us to do something, do we say yes obediently, or do we say, well, I'll do it when I have time, or when I can afford it, or whenever? But when they say that to us, they're in rebellion. It's funny how it's easy to see the stake or splinter in someone else's eye with a beam in our own. I want to tell you right now, kids don't just end up always the way they are. I realize there are circumstances that play into this, but we have to look at our life also and what have we taught them? How many of you know that really it's, it's really sad because we don't understand the power of sowing and reaping? And how many of you know you don't start trying to train up a child in the way they should go when they're 16? word says train up a child in the way they should go when they're young and when they're old. It doesn't say they might go out there and be a mess but you can stand on the promise when they've seen what you've done. What people don't understand is sowing and reaping is so powerful and the younger you start. Do you know I mean my, my blessing was in finances before I was a minister. I worked in money. Gold, silver, different things. Do you know that what people don't understand, and I try to teach this to my own family, the younger you start saving, the more powerful it is. You know, if a person at 20 years old puts $50 away a month at 20 years old, and their sibling 
starts putting $50 away at 30 years old, they can give until they're 60. And do you know one that started at 20 will have double the amount the one that started at 30? Double, not just 10% more because they did it for 10 more years. They'll have double in finances because of the principle of sowing early and reaping. That is a principle you cannot stop. If you put something away, the younger you are, the more compounded interest you have and the anointing it is. It's just like I believe in the kingdom of God. And thank you for these. I can tell you guys understand, but what you don't understand is what are we teaching our children? Do you teach your children that money is only a tool? Do you teach your children that money is what God gave them? He not only gave them air, food, but did you teach them that literally when they were at home to eat from your table, you sown to God first? Because the word said they're going to come a day when they're going to ask you, why do you do this? And how many of you know you better have an answer? Because you can't expect things from them that you're not willing to do yourself. Right. Amen. Amen. Amen? Boy, it's quiet in here. I mean, I didn't say this. That's what it said. There's going to come a day when your sons and your daughters are going to come and ask you, why do you do this? And look at what he said. He said, and it shall come to pass, or excuse me, but it will, you will say, but strength, the strong hand of the Lord brought me out of Egypt. I don't act like the world. I don't eat it all for myself. And delivered me from the house of bondage. How many of you know that, in fact, let me just say this in closing. How many of you know there's no problems like money problems? Money causes probably more divorce than infidelity and all the other things combined. The incatabalability because there is no pressure like money pressure. And part of it is, is because we live in a society that everything is almost class-based. What you drive, what kind of car you have, what kind of home you live in. How many of you know that has nothing to do with your spiritual life? Do I think God wants to bless you? Yes. But we don't judge a box by its outside cover. But at the same time, then we can't fall into the system of the world. We have to understand the system of God. We have to know the power and the anointing of God. And when we do what God says, how many of you know, then we can stand and say, God, I've done what you have told me to do. I believe I will be blessed, not because of everything in me, but because you've delivered me. How many of you are saved in here? By being born again through Jesus Christ. Okay, if you're saved, how many of you know, then you've been brought out of the curse if you desire it. And if you have been brought out of the curse, then how many of you know you're different to, just look at your neighbor and say, you're different. Now look at him again and say, you're special. Just tell him that, you're special. Somebody used to come and tell Pastor Sandy every time he preached, he used to say, oh, Pastor Sandy, you're special. But what I'm really saying is you are. The power, the anointing of God is on us. He doesn't want to curse you. So many people think that God is an ogre waiting for you to get out of line just so he can whack you. How many of you know that's not true? God doesn't put cancer on you. God doesn't want bad things to happen to you. But how many of you know you've got to come out from under that curse? He's brought you out, but you have to realize that for yourself. And you have to be able to claim the word of God, the power, and the anointing. When your kids ask, and we live in a society, and let me close with this, but it's so true. You know, I've been thankful for every paycheck I've ever got. Because really, I get paid for what I just love to do. My grandfather always told me, if you're going to be happy in life, Steve, find something you love to do and get paid for it. Why is that? Well, I didn't know it was ministry. Believe me, I did not know it was ministry when he told me that. I mean, the real power of this word is, and I still remember it, I remember the first check I ever got for preaching a sermon. And I've said to the Lord so many times, 
Never let me forget that feeling. Let me always appreciate what you do for me and to give to you first. And I want to tell you, if you do that, life is so much better. Because most of us know what it's like when we first got set free from this world. And the real power that is there. And then we walk through life and we have a tendency to sometimes forget just how it really felt. And I want to tell you, I don't ever want to forget that feeling. Because when I forget that feeling, I really lost what I was really called to do. And I know that if I walk in the promise of God, if I seek God first, if I think about doing things His way, it says in the Gospel of Matthew, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. The word righteousness literally means God's way of doing things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and then all these things will be added unto you. How many of you know many people, they want the addition, but they don't want the first part of that. Seeking God first. Putting God first. Let him be first in your marriage. Let him be first with your finances. Let him be first with your kids. When you put him first, there's no losing. And so I'm here to tell you today, God doesn't need your money. I love you and God blesses our body. It's amazing to me out of the few hundred people that come here what God brings into this body. But I know it's because people love God more than they love money or the curse of this world. And church, if you'll do that, and you that maybe can't, or you think you can't, start somewhere. Bring something to God. Start somewhere, and you'll find out. Malachi, this very passage, also says, try me and see if I won't bless you. He didn't say there wouldn't be any hard times, but he'll bless you. The anointing is there if you'll only fulfill that principle. And so this is the first of the year. Dedicate this time. Dedicate prayer and like we did the word this week and fast and let the Spirit of God move in your life because I don't know about you, but I don't want to get on the end of my life and find out the ladder's leaned up on the wrong wall. <laughs> I want to know the principles of God and His faithfulness. But how many of you know He wants to know that He's God to me too? That's right. And so when we do that, and that's really challenging in a society today that's eat it all. You baby boomers that are in here, it's not all about you. You busters, it's not all about you. Even the millennial generation that's coming along right now. Learn to leave something for your kids. Give your kids. Help your kids. But don't be silly. But I see people so often, and money probably causes as many, not divorces, but problems in families. My grandfather also told me something as a young man I've never forgotten. I'm going to tell you. Don't ever loan your money, your children money. Never. If you can't afford to give it away, don't give it to them. Because your mom and dad, and the chances of you getting that back is slim to none. <laughs> Tell them if they need a loan, go to the bank. They aren't mom and dad. And I'm not saying that don't help them. What I'm saying is help them where you can afford it. If you can't afford to give it, because I know people that are, won't speak for years because they loaned a family member or a child money and they never paid it back. And do you really think that's what God wants? See, if he can't get in through the door, he'll try to come in through a window. If he can't come in through a window, he'll come through the sewer if he has to. So listen to me. It's not about money. It's really about our heart. And hear my heart here this morning. I want everybody in this body to be blessed. But if I don't teach you this, how will you know? The world tells you, take care of yourself. No one else cares. 
That is a lie right from the pit of hell. God cares. Amen? Amen. Did you get anything out of that this morning? Yes. Come on, give the Lord a praise clap in this house. Ooh, hallelujah.